Good evening. This is a uh, a video message for Sister Jackie. I appreciate you uh, considering me to ask me um, a question where as the answer to the question has powerful, powerful implications. Um, so I wrote down some notes here from your actual question because the... It was a multifaceted question with a lot of points and a lot of questions to it. You made a lot of good points. You're considering some powerful things. Um, so I I, uh, I appreciate the fact that you thought so much of me and my wife to, to care about our opinion as it pertains to these questions, which, like I said before, have incredible implications. So let's 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 uh let's get into it. I think some of the main things that you were asking, the number one thing that the first thing in other words that you were uh asking about was the tent of meeting. From our reading of the scriptures, the tent of meeting, I think you're right on point to the extent that the tent of meeting seems to be a place, a temporary place that they used while they were walking through the wilderness. And it was a temporary place such that before there was a tabernacle, there seemed to be a tent of meeting where God would actually meet Moses. And then later on, it seemed to be also that same place seemed to be called the tent of meeting where the people would actually come to meet Moses. It did not seem to be the tabernacle because there were times when uh, the tabernacle was in use, but there still seemed to be a tent of meeting. So they didn't seem to be the same place. Also, the tent of the tabernacle itself seemed to be right in the middle of the camp with the 12 tribes in different places around the tabernacle. Whereas the tent of meeting was probably a couple miles away from the tabernacle because the camp itself was probably so large. The tent, the tent of meeting is described as being, at least it seems to be from the scriptures outside of the camp. Whereas the tabernacle is right in the middle of the camp. And uh, of course, we know that the tent of meeting really did appear to be temporary and the tabernacle lasted for a couple hundred years up until the time of Solomon, as, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so if I could clear up the difference there, you also added a question here about the tent of meeting. Was it a place of worship and was it like our modern day churches? I would be I would be inclined to say no on that. My opinion would be no. I, it did not seem to be a place of worship. Um, and it did not seem to be like what we would consider today a modern day church. It did not. That, that's not the impression that I get from the scriptures. Also, as I talk a little bit about the church, the church seems to be the place where God wants his people, the church, as we as we talk about the buildings of the church, the building, it seems to be the place where God's people come together for corporate prayer, corporate worship, uh, for the using of their gifts together to bless each other. I mean, spiritual gifts to bless each other. I mean, words of prophecy, words of knowledge, wisdom, tongues, interpretation of tongues, teaching and things like that. Um, where we come together to bless each other with our spiritual gifts. And of course, that's not the only place we bless each other with spiritual gifts, but those things really, particularly if you look at passages in 1 Corinthians, and if you, if you, uh, it seems to be that those things are operating in the church with groups of Christians together in an actual building, uh, fellowshipping together. It, it, it is also a place of, uh, of fellowship and community. Uh, it seems to be what the church is, is intended to be. It also, it seems to be a place where 
God intends for his people to go, to come together to, to listen to the teaching of the scriptures. Where the scriptures is taught in a place and everyone is listening to the teaching of the scriptures together. That None of those things seem to be the purpose of the tent of meeting. Um, so I, I don't know that I would put them on the same level. Eventually, after the exile from Babylon, they did have, they did establish a system similar to what we have in churches called the synagogue. The, the, well, actually, they started that, that tradition in Babylon. Um, the synagogue, literally. So they've been, been doing that now for 2,500 Jews have been doing, practicing uh, Judaism and gathering together in synagogues for 2,500 years now. And that started during their time in Babylon. And and you would start a synagogue with, with all you needed was 10 men. If you could find 10 men together that wanted to do the same things, they wanted to come together, they wanted to discuss the scriptures and things like that, then you could effectively form a synagogue. So it, the tent of meeting didn't seem to be the same thing as the synagogue or the church. Those seem to be two separate uh, purposes. But I will say this. What the New Testament always talks about the church, it seems to be the place where I, I look at Ephesians chapter 6. That seems to be the place where God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers around verse 11, for the building up of the saints and for the edification of the body of Christ such that the new believers can eventually be brought to a place of maturity so that they can now be ready to go out and work ministry. Uh, whatever that particular ministry is, of course, ministry is contingent upon uh, what burden of service or ministry that God has placed on your heart and what gifts and talents and temperament that he's given you such that it fits a certain place in the world or in the church. That's that's what your ministry ends up becoming. But there's a certain level of maturity that God uses the church to bring the new Christians to a point before they're ready to go and serve and perform ministry. That's what Ephesians chapter 6 makes it appears to me to be saying. Also, as we look at, uh, you had mentioned in your question, Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 25 and verse, verse 26. Um, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but in verse 26, I believe it says, uh, but even more so as you see the day approaching. According to the way that passage is written, it doesn't necessarily appear to me like it's actually saying, go to church on a regular basis. It seems like what it's saying to me is wherever you find groups of Christians, Christian friends, Christian family members, Christians in your community, every time you get a chance, get with the saints. Get around the saints, be with the saints, so that you can be poked in your side, so that you can be provoked to love and godliness and good works. Because being around other folks who think like you, who serve the same God, who's filled with the same Holy Ghost, who's reading the whole, the same Bible that you're reading, and their minds are on the same mindset as yours. They believe in righteousness. They believe in holiness. They believe in reaching a lost world for Christ. They have trusted in the blood and, and, and they've been washed by the blood and they've been washed and cleansed and delivered by the power of God. Those are the folks that you need to get around as often as you can find them. And of course, one of the ways that God facilitates that is actually in a church building or in a church service. But then there's certain levels of fellowship that an organized church service or church meeting can't facilitate, you know, laughing with my brother or, or listening to his testimony or, or rejoicing with him because he just got the job he was praying for, or having uh, a, a, a moment of reproof or stern talking to because we know that this brother needs to correct a certain a, a certain thing. 
or, or, or just uh, having a talk with him about his relationship with his wife. You can't do that in a church service. So, but we understand that the saints need to do that for each other. We need to brush up against each other. We need to uh, sharpen each other's iron. We need to encourage each other. And yet we need to reprove each other um, in love and in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted in, in the book of Galatians chapter six. So, so we see that these things are important. They're vital, vital needs for the Christian. We look at Acts chapter two. As that chapter closes out, we see that uh, it was considered a good thing that the new disciples came together in Acts chapter 2 and they continued together steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and breaking of bread and in prayer. And the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. That's the King James Version. So, it is important, very important, that Christians be in constant, regular fellowship with other Christians because you need somebody to push you. You need somebody to expose you to a new ministry or a new style of ministry. Like you, you might not ever know that, that that prison ministry could be the place where God's calling you unless someone in prison ministry invites you to come minister with them. And once you get up in that service or get into that prison ministry, there's just a deep, powerful burden of love that just drops all over you that this is where I need to be. This is where the need is. Well, if you don't have that church facilitating those opportunities, you may wander for 10 or 15 years not knowing what your ministry is. So it, it is now to, to get to the other main crux of your question, do we have to effectively, I'm going to put in quotes here, join a church? Well, I don't know that there's a particular Bible passage anywhere in the entire Bible, and I've been through the whole thing multiple times, that actually says you should effectively join a church. It doesn't explicitly say that, but the implication is there. The implication is that you should be a part of a regular, consistent group of Christian friends and brothers and sisters who you love on them, they love on you, they encourage you, you encourage them, you're reading together, you're praying together, you're fellowshipping together, you're putting your monies together, you're putting your time together, you're doing things in the community together, you're doing things for the body of Christ together. That is a very powerful and a strong implication. Now, now let, let me, it doesn't effectively say that you should join but you know that the implication is there and the assumption is that you've joined a church because that's the way that you're going to listen to Ephesians chapter four, have a pastor. God has placed pastors in the body of Christ. He's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And also in Titus chapter one, elders, and also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, elders and deacons, as I look at Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, uh, Phoebe was a deaconess, or in Greek diaconia, in English deaconess. And, can, and most of the translations that says servant, but that word diaconia in Greek is, uh, is the same exact word, which means deacon. Um, so, and in the church, it says right there in Romans chapter 16, verse one, there are passages in the scriptures that you just would assume that it's saying it is a regular, consistent, organized fashion church with a leadership machinery in place 
and a group of disciples, a leadership and folks are being trained and they're loving on each other and they're being uh, trained for ministry and, and, and they're loving on each other and they're encouraging each other. So I would say that you should definitely be a part of a ministry where folks are holding you accountable, but where you're also holding folks accountable. Now, the way that the dichotomy of the church appears to come across the pages of scripture is that all of the saints need each other. And there doesn't really seem to be a model where a pastor or group of elders rule as tyrants and they don't have a accountability where pastors can do and say whatever they want and nobody can ask them the hard questions. That does not seem to be the way that the scriptures lay it out. Although that is what you commonly see in the church today, that that does not seem to be the scriptural model um, because it is very clear that there is a group of qualifications and a group of criteria that the pastors and elders and deacons ought to meet before um, they're considered for the pastorate. Okay, the, the scriptures is very clear about that. So, <clears throat> so to give you a little, uh, just a short recap, yes, you probably should be with a body of believers where you're being taught the word of God on a regular basis, where you're giving your time, your resources, and um, so if you play music, you should be playing it at, at one church. If you if you are a if you love children then you probably should be doing children's ministry at a church. If you know, if uh, if whatever your ministry is, you should offer your gift to the body of Christ. Uh, if you just love to exercise, bring that into the body of Christ, because there's folks who who need exercise, but they don't know where to start. That's the perfect place for you to do ministry. Um, so, so there's all different kinds of functions and, and ways that the body of Christ works itself out. I'll, I'll close out with this part here. There's a large contingency of the body of Christ that is very much disenchanted and discouraged and have become somewhat uh, pessimistic by what we're seeing in the church today. And um, as much as we know we need the church, it's hard to find a good one anymore. It's really hard to find a good one anymore. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, if you want to give your time and you want to be committed, um, you, you, then you don't want to give your time and, and your money and be committed and your ministry and then come to find out that the leadership was corrupt. Or there were some shady things going on behind the scenes. So, I'm, I mean, or let's say that the pastor was playing power games and or, or the pastor was just uh, mismanaging and abusing the money. Or you feel like the first family just runs it like it's their own small, small business. And, and you know, yeah, those things happen and it's, it happens all too normal and all too common. But I would say... um. Cry to God with your concern. Lord, I, I know I need to be in a church, but but I'm tired of the games. I'm, I'm tired of the games. Lord, please show me where, where I should be. <clears throat> and if God takes a while to place something on your heart, then then you just keep moving until, until God just places, say, just stay here for a few years. Just stay here for two years. I just want to show you some things. That there are some time. There was a church I went to a few years back where, when I got there, I now I can see the sense that the Lord w had me there temporarily, just to show me some things because I didn't know that the body of Christ was 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 corrupt as it was, until I actually got to this particular church where the Lord had me for about three years. Um, it was really bad. And, and this was a side of the body of Christ that I had never seen before. Um, 
because the first church I had ever joined, I was there for 15 years. It's the church where I met my wife. And there were some things going on there too, but the fellowship was so good. The word was good. The corporate prayer, everything was so good. Um, and, and then the Lord decided to start uncovering some things and start saying, hey, this stuff is going on and I'm not pleased with it. Um, and people started moving on. So, you know, God has his remnant. That That's what I'm going to say. God has his remnant. And, you know, based off of your question, you must be a part of the remnant. God has a handful of folks that's going to serve him and love him no matter what. You know, um, and, and God's got you and, and he's got you on his mind and, and you've got him on his mind. And that's the place where you want to be. And, um, and, and, you know, God knows that you want to be connected with a with, with a good body and a solid body um, of, of good of good solid believers um, but God also knows that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find a good church anymore so um I, I just believe that God is going to lead his people and God is going to bless his people um so that's all I'm going to say to that you know God and, and um may, maybe we'll have to get to a point where we'll We'll just have to fellowship in each other's houses and, and read the scriptures, you know, and not be an organized church. Maybe another five or 10 years, it will get to that point. Um, but if some somebody somewhere appreciates your gifts and, and let you serve in the serve in the ministry and you can be blessed by them and a true good word of God is being taught, then that's so rare nowadays that um, if you can find it, God bless you. But but I definitely encourage you to keep looking um, because, it you know, it, it, it's kind of imperative that that we spend time with God's people, even if it's a text message once a week or a text message every couple of days, uh, reading Christian articles or Christian news and just sending it out to encourage God's people. Um, if that's all of the connection you can make with God's people, then you need to make it. You know, everyone needs it. I need it. You need it. Um, all of us need it. So I hope that this time, um, the things that I said, I hope it was helpful and I hope it was a blessing. And, um, if not, you can send me back another text or you can send my wife a text. And if it's a blessing, Hey, then I'm glad I could help. God bless you.